It gives me uh, great pleasure to, uh, to introduce now uh, Dr. Uh, Reisman, who is the chair of the Department of Surgery at uh, Sherzadek Medical Center in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, Dr. Reisman is going to be presenting to us on intraoperative ultrasound in laparoscopic pancreatic surgery for neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, good morning, Dr. Reisman, and welcome. Good morning, good morning. I want to welcome you all, all the centers uh, from Jerusalem. We are at Sharet Sedek Medical Center. Uh, here it's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's at 27 centigrade. So, um, well, we'll talk uh, this morning about uh, intraoperative, the use of intraoperative ultrasound uh, for uh, surgery of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, or PNETs in short. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll have a short introduction of uh, PNETs. Uh, we'll talk about the specific surgical considerations and challenges when uh, dealing with uh, these unique tumors. Uh, we will talk about the basic principles, technique, and the current use of intraoperative laparoscopic ultrasound. We'll discuss the specific advantages of using uh, intraoperative ultrasound when operating on the PNETs. Uh, and we will also demonstrate the use of uh, laparoscopic intraoperative ultrasound in different procedures. We'll have several video clips showing uh, resection of these tumors from different anatomical regions in the pancreas. Um, we'll share with you uh, briefly our results, and uh, we will sure have enough time for discussion and hear uh, from the experience in other centers. So, in brief, uh, PNETs are uh, very rare. You see the incidence and prevalence here. Um, insulinoma is definitely the most common PNET uh, that we face. Um, most of them are sporadic, uh, solitary, and benign tumors, and also very small. Uh, the average size is about one centimeter. Um, a very small percentage of them are multiple, and then they are, in most cases, part of one of the genetic uh, syndromes like MEN1 or von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Um, and only if they are bigger than two centimeters in size, we have to suspect that they are a malignant one. Next is gastrinomas. Um, unfortunately, the majority of these tumors, when discovered, are uh, not only uh, um, a cancerous, but also metastatic. The non-functioning uh, tumors, about 15% of cases. Um, now here, uh, we still have an unresolved issue. It used to be thought that uh, every non-functioning PNET above two centimeters in size should be resected, as the incidence of malignancy is high in these tumors. However, in the last years, there were several uh, studies showing that there is uh, up to 7 or 10 percent malignancy rate, even in smaller size non-functioning PNET. And that raised really uh, a discussion if we really can only observe smaller PNETs that are incidentally found, and when should we operate on these uh, patients. And I think we should uh, dedicate a few minutes of discussion for, the, for this uh, unresolved issue. There are other very rare uh, PNETs, as shown here. And of course, uh, only complete surgical excision um, is uh, the, uh, the only curative treatment. Now, one of the problems with PNETs is the imaging. And the commonly used uh, CT or MRI are accurate only in up to 60% of cases. Uh, the historical, I should say, uh, octreotide scan, because we no longer use that type of scan, was also accurate only in about 70% of cases. However, the more recently introduced PET gallium 68 scan, which is uh, uh, connected to a molecule of Dotanoc or Dotatoc, um, has a much better accuracy. This molecule has an affinity to somatostatin receptors 1 to 5, which are present uh, in about 90% of these tumors. Uh, mind you, this is a PET gallium scan, not a PET FDG a regular scan that we use for cancer patients. Um, better than this is the uh, EUS, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, with also accuracy of about uh, 90%. And I think this is uh, absolutely a mandatory preoperative study to do uh, before uh, we consider an operation. And just to show you, uh, this is a picture of the PET gallium scan. Uh, this is a normal uptake in the liver and the spleen, but you see here 
There is uptake of a lesion in the tail of the pancreas. This was a tail peanut. And these are images of the EUS. This is a tumor here in the uh, head of the pancreas. This is the SMV here. Um, and this is a biopsy needle going through this tumor uh, to obtain a biopsy. Now, I'll put here a question mark near the word biopsy because we not always like to get a biopsy prior to operation. And many times, if we think that there is a full indication for surgery, uh, we would avoid a biopsy just because, in many cases, this biopsy can cause hemorrhage or even severe pancreatitis. And then to operate on these patients and sometimes to find a very small tumor embedded in the pancreatic tissue after pancreatitis or a big hematoma, this makes our life very uh, difficult. Now, the best imaging uh, uh, for these peanuts is the intraoperative ultrasound with an accuracy of up to 100%. Uh, this is a very sensitive uh, modality that can show us uh, peanuts uh, that are also very, very small. Now, these are two examples of peanuts that did show on CT scan. And uh, you see here uh, a lesion that is, uh, has a, a high concentration of contrast material. It actually looks like a blood vessel, but it's not. It's an insulinoma, which is a very vascular lesion in the head of the pancreas. And this is a non-functioning peanut in the tail of the pancreas. Now, what are the procedures performed for uh, these peanuts? If they are small and suspected to be benign, we do an enucleation, which is actually extraction of the lesion itself out of the pancreatic tissue. Or we do a formal resection, and uh, like distal pancreatectomy, with or without spleen preservation, subtotal pancreatectomy, or even a Whipple's procedure. Um, for insulinomas, if we cannot uh, localize the lesion intraoperatively, then no resection is performed. Uh, this is different uh, from uh, the past, where uh, people thought that uh, you should do a distal pancreatectomy, hoping that the occult lesion will be present in the portion of the pancreas that you removed. But this uh, didn't uh, really work. Uh, so today, we will not do any uh, resection. We can take a biopsy to rule out the uh, nesidioblastosis, uh, but definitely not a uh, resection. These are, uh, example, uh, this is an example of a laparoscopic enucleation. This is the body of the pancreas. This is what we resected. This is the defect. And this is a typical appearance of a peanut. Uh, surrounded by some normal pancreatic tissue. Now, what are the special features of peanuts, or why do we really need the help of the intraoperative ultrasound when we uh, operate on them? Well, a, a, uh, the majority, or I would say about two-thirds of cases, they are very small. They are embedded into the pancreatic tissue, so they are not seen outside, on the outside on observation. Um, they are difficult to identify as we cannot do any palpation of the pancreas during laparoscopy. Um, if uh, you do a palpation, many of these tumors are firm and harder than the normal pancreatic tissue. Uh, but of course, in laparoscopy, we have uh, not the uh, ability to palpate. Now, we need to uh, visualize uh, not only the tumor itself, but also the relation of the tumor to the adjacent anatomical structures uh, like the adrenal wall, CBD, pancreatic duct, and the major vessel. Uh, and after we gain this information, only then we can decide what procedure uh, should be done, either an enucleation or a formal resection. We also have to uh, look for uh, synchronous peanuts in other portions of the pancreas. And uh, the, the incidence of a synchronous lesion is up to 10% of cases. This is not very rare. Um, the intraoperative ultrasound can uh, find lesions as small as 2 millimeter. If we do a formal resection, we use the ultrasound to determine the exact, the exact site of the vision of the pancreatic uh, tissue to make sure that we are far enough from the lesion uh, and uh, will have a safe margin. Um, now, intraoperative ultrasound in open surgery was uh, popularized in the uh, 70s. Uh, already then, we realized that it can provide a real-time image uh, of the anatomy and the lesions that we are looking for. And this is actually a computer-generated uh, picture that is based on a grayscale. Um, and uh, the uh, quality of the returning uh, sound wave from the tissue 
uh, are uh, reflecting, are reflected on the screen. Uh, different tissues, different quality will uh, have a different uh, return of the sound wave. Um, and uh, historically, we use the uh, intraoperative uh, ultrasound in open surgery uh, for hepatobiliary surgery. Uh, with the introduction of laparoscopic surgery in the early 90s, uh, very soon laparoscopic ultrasound probes uh, uh, became available. Um, and commonly, we use a linear array tip. Uh, it's flexible. It has four-way 90 degrees uh, angulation. Uh, it is introduced through a 10 millimeter uh, port, and it also has the ability to show color flow Doppler that helps to distinguish between uh, blood vessels and other uh, structures. You see here um, the laparoscopic probes. Um, there is also a needle that you can introduce through the tip, and if you need intraoperative biopsy of a suspected lesion, this can be done. The flexibility of the tip also allows us to scan the pancreas not only on the anterior surface, this is the body of the pancreas here, but also from the bottom looking up, this is the probe, and sometimes uh, scanning the pancreas uh, this way gives us a better view of the tumor that we are looking for. We use a frequency of 5 to 10 megahertz uh, that gives us tissue penetration of up to 10 centimeters. Now, this is the main unit. It can be rolled in into the operating room. These are the tips. The knobs here are very similar to a colonoscopy device, uh, and this way we can manipulate the tip to each direction. Um, the first uh, one who reported the use of intraoperative laparoscopic ultrasound to remove a pancreatic tumor was Sir Alfred Cuscieri back in 93. Um, now, this is the screen of the main unit, but we no longer have to look at this screen uh, what we use is the picture-in-picture -picture modality, so the surgeon do not have, does not have to turn his head from side to side. We look at one screen and we see both the laparoscopic image and the surgical field. What are the current uses of intraoperative laparoscopic ultrasound? It can be used as a diagnostic modality for staging or assessment of operability in uh, gastric, uh, pancreas, and liver cancer. And for benign disease, we uh, use it to uh, detect CBD stones uh, during lab cholecystectomy. However, I have to mention that the recently introduced fluoroscopic uh, guided uh, surgery, when you inject the fluorescent uh, agent and uh, demonstrate the CBD, this looks a little easier than uh, laparoscopic ultrasound. So I'm not sure what's the future of uh, lab ultrasound for this uh, specific indication. As a surgical uh, tool, we use the ultrasound in pancreatic resections, liver resections, also radiofrequency ablation, uh, or in cases that we need to do a partial splenectomy or partial nephrectomy, where the ultrasound will guide us uh, where to uh, do exactly the tissue dissection and the vision uh, during the surgery. Now, as mentioned before, EUS endoscopic ultrasound is really a mandatory and crucial uh, study to have prior to any uh, operation. And what we do, we compare the image uh, during surgery to the preoperative image on EUS. And uh, I will show you here a short uh, clip. This is a lesion that did show on CT. It's a central located uh, P-net. And this is a probe that is into the, in the stomach. And what we see here is a lesion. It's a P-net located at the confluence. This is the splenic artery, splenic vein. This is the SMV, portal vein. Um, and again, SMV, splenic vein, portal vein. This is the lesion itself. And what we do uh, want to see now is the distance between the lesion and the pancreatic duct. And uh, you see that it's a vascular lesion on the Doppler uh, uh, modality here. And now we are looking for the pancreatic duct. This is the pancreatic duct here. This is the lesion. So we see that we do have about uh, one or two millimeter distance between the lesion and the pancreatic duct, uh, which means that we uh, can perform um, an enucleation rather than a uh, formal uh, resection. Um, now we want to see uh, the same lesion uh, from a different angle. So the uh, transducer is now in the duodenum. And we are now looking uh, from uh, 
the duodenal side uh, on the same lesion. Um, and we can see here, this is the pancreatic duct. This is the lesion here. And we see again that we do have a small rim of tissue between the duct and the, and the lesion as shown here. And that means that we can go ahead and do an enucleation. And these are some still images. Um, you see here the picture of the EUS. Uh, you see the lesion, the SMV. And this is uh, the same lesion and the image uh, obtained during uh, the laparoscopic ultrasound. And you see here, again, the lesion, the SMV. What you can see here is the CBD. And you see the duodenal folds. This is the duodenal mucosa here. And all this is the pancreatic head. So I think uh, you would agree with me. You, you can get a fairly accurate image um, during surgery that will help you out to uh, uh, dissect precisely. So I think maybe you can stop at this point and have Dr. Park uh, Great. moderate Thanks. some Thanks discussion. Thanks very much, Dr. Reisman. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's step back a bit. We always have a lot of residents and fellows in attendance in the audience. And so let's go to our friends at uh, Mount Sinai if we, if we can. And I want to ask... Um, I want to ask, I see uh, Dan and uh, Barry there and um, Dr. Navnet. Um, what, what's your approach? We've seen a wonderful presentation so far in the use of, of uh, IOUS. Um, what, what's your approach before you get there to the non-functional uh, islet cell tumor, uh, Dr. Navnet? And, um, and do you have access yourself to uh, intraoperative ultrasound, uh, any turf issues? Can't be any turf issues at Sinai, I'm sure. But how, how does uh, how does that work with your center? <laughs> um, good. Uh, thank you for those questions, Adrian. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. And in, um, in Jerusalem, um, I'm here with Dr. Heron and my colleagues, residents and fellows from Mount Sinai. Um, we I couldn't agree. I mean, I agree with everything that was said in the presentation. Dr. Reisman did an excellent job summarizing the utility of um, intraoperative ultrasound, and it really is um, a mandatory component um, of uh, laparoscopic pancreatic surgery, so there really should be no turf issue. It is part of the operation. And an analogy is when, as endocrine surgeons, we use ultrasound in the office every day. It's part of the physical examination. Uh, we use it primarily in the neck, looking at thyroid and parathyroid pathology. So our trainees gain a lot of experience with the use of ultrasound in the practice setting, and that translates to what we do in the operating room. Um, EUS is a critical uh, component of the pathway of the workup of an endocrine uh, tumor of the pancreas. And um, it can help with some of the um, dilemmas or challenges with decision making uh, that Dr. Reisman raised. For example, the non functional PNET. This is an example where you may use EUS directed biopsy prior to surgery because you can get the KI67 uh, index information, mitotic uh, index information on your cytology, and that might heighten your suspicion for malignancy, for example, and a small non functioning PNET that then may tilt you more towards the surgical management as opposed to observation. So we don't routinely biopsy um, all of our, our peanuts um, with EUS prior to surgery unless um, there is a clinical concern for malignancy or a diagnostic dilemma. Um, I think EUS um, is, uh, um, also provides information about um, the uh, location, the features of the peanut as very well described by Dr. Reisman. And that um, you should really go into the operation knowing what you're going to do. You should have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And all of those should be discussed with the patient in great detail prior to surgery. So plan A may be an enucleation, uh, plan B may be a uh, splenic preserving distal pancreatectomy, and plan C may be a formal distal pancreatectomy. And I think also um, when you have peanuts in the head of the pancreas, um, EUS directed therapy such as alcohol ablation is something that maybe we can discuss um, later in the presentation. And finally, I'd just like to would push back a little bit with one of Dr. Reisman's comments about nercidia blastosis. We have found that an EUS directed uh, biopsy has really been unhelpful in diagnosing that very rare condition in adults. And in fact, even a core biopsy, which can be performed, um, doesn't provide enough tissue to really exclude that diagnosis. And we prefer to perform more of a functional study in the non localized um, uh, hyper, hypoglycemic syndrome. Um, and do a calcium stimulation test with hepatic venous sampling where you can look at the functioning of the entire pancreas um, as determined by its um, inflow, arterial inflow, 
and determine if there is a um, uh, area of the pancreas, the tail, the body, or the head that has a greater increase of insulin secretion following a calcium injection. And if you see a diffuse um, uh, increase in your baseline insulin levels, then that's how, that's one way that is very effective for, for diagnosing um, nercidioblastosis. And then, of course, that's going to alter your surgical therapy from the outset. Um, but I, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Reisman on an uh, excellent, very clear presentation, and I agree with most everything he said. He did a great job. Great, great comment. You. Appreciate that very much. Tell me, how often would you order um, uh, the calcium stimulating, the uh, arterial stimulation of calcium? Is that, is that a once a year thing? Is your center, you know, able to step up when you need it? Uh, well, yesterday we had Adrian Vela from the Mayo Clinic here giving grand rounds in endocrinology, and I had a long conversation with him about this. And I'll be honest, our IR team did their first one a month ago, and we pulled the literature uh, and instructed them how to do that. And I shared those data with Dr. Vela, um, de-identified, to ask his opinion. And it was difficult to interpret. In fact, we were somewhat misled that this non-localized patient um, had nystidioblastosis, a 35-year-old male. And we went to the operating room, and at surgery, we actually um, identified what we thought was an insulinoma, but uh, I, I was a little insecure. We ended up doing an extended distal pancreatectomy, and in the specimen, what we saw was, in fact, an insulinoma. And when we bivalved the tumor, it had more of a, a fleshy brown um, appearance as opposed to the typical peanut that has sort of a whitish tan appearance. And that's probably why it didn't have the same echogenicity pattern as a typical peanut. Our EUS team is very good. They're 90, 95 percent accurate, and they also didn't see this tumor. But um, be careful because it's a very specialized study, and the Mayo Clinic team does this day in and day out. They're able to define the arterial of anatomy of the pancreas, and there's huge variations in that anatomy, and that influences your functional interpretation of the functional uh, hormone results. So it's not just something you have your IR guys do. It requires a little bit of finesse. Yeah, a good point, point well made. Thanks very much. Let, let's head to um, up to Halifax, Nova Scotia, to Dalhousie University. Um, and uh, the question to our colleagues um, at Dalhousie is, uh, once again, your workup, do you have uh, IOUS available to the surgeon? Is this a surgeon-directed uh, modality? And um, what's your approach to the non-functional? How, how small is too small to resect? To resect? What are the issues in around you're deciding to resect versus observe? Good morning. Um, uh, Jim Ellsmer here. Uh, those are uh, very intriguing questions, and I'd love to pose them to our uh, pancreatic uh, surgery group, but no, none of them, unfortunately, are uh, available this morning. I do have a few questions uh, uh, regarding the, the presentation, though, which I, it's been uh, been tremendous. Um, one of the points that came up uh, was um, the utility of uh, doing laparoscopic ultrasound uh, guided uh, biopsies, and um, I wanted to know specifically uh, what uh, what sort of uh, biopsy needle was used with the laparoscopic ultrasound, because typically that, uh, unlike the endoscopic ultrasound world where the uh, the biopsy needles have underwent several iterations of, of, of development. The, the biopsy needles that were available traditionally for laparoscopic ultrasound were actually were quite poor, and there wasn't a, a lot done in terms of uh, improving them. So I was wondering if, uh, if the, uh, the presenter can speak on that issue specifically. All okay, right. Um, um, let, let me hand back. Uh, um, nice segue there, uh, Jim. Let's uh, hand back to uh, Dr. Reisman. Uh, Dr. Reisman, why don't you just answer the question and then continue with your presentation? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we, um, I would say, very rarely would need to do an intraoperative biopsy uh, through uh, using this working channel um, that is uh, located in the uh, ultrasound tip. Um, as mentioned in Mount Sinai, our EUS uh, people are. Uh, really very talented, and they would be accurate in, uh, I would say, 95 percent of cases. So it would be very rare. However, um, I don't know what would be other centers' experience, but sometimes you can find in the uh, IOS um, 
also another finding that is suspicious. You're not sure whether it's a, it's a real uh, synchronous spinet um, or because it was not seen on the preoperative US. Um, and then you would have to biopsy. And we did have a couple of cases that um, the pathology showed uh, focal pancreatitis, but on the uh, intraoperative ultrasound, and also then when we removed the lesion and palpated it, it really was very similar um, uh, to uh, a peanut. Uh, however, the needle uh, is supplied by the manufacturer. Uh, it's a standard needle um, that you can do both a uh, small core biopsy and also cytology. You put it on a uh, smear and uh, have also a pathologist look at the cytology, and that can uh, be uh, very helpful. Um, so let me go back to uh, the presentation. And uh, we uh, spoke before uh, about uh, the split screen or the picture-in-picture -picture modality that we use. Uh, and you can see here um, uh, what we are looking at. Uh, this is the portal vein, SMV. This is the neck of the pancreas. Uh, this is the head of the pancreas. The duodenum is here in the background. And this is the uh, laparoscopic probe. And this is the ultrasound image. And you, as you can see here, uh, about two millimeters under the surface of the pancreas, there is this lesion, uh, which is a pinna that we are uh, going to enucleate. Um, and uh, just to show you how the picture in picture is working. Now, we were talking about synchronous lesions, uh, uh, synchronous pinnets in the pancreas. And this is an example. Uh, you see here that the CT scan is not showing much, but on the PET gallium scan, you see uh, two lesions here in the uh, body of the pancreas, and um, this is the intraoperative ultrasound showing the same two lesions, and this is the ultrasound image, and you can see the similarity uh, also in the size of these two lesions here. Of course, this patient uh, underwent a uh, distal uh, pancreatectomy. We cannot do multiple enucleations and uh, leave the pancreas as a Swiss cheese. Um, anyway, despite of all these advantages that were mentioned of using intraoperative ultrasound, uh, it was interesting to see that on a survey uh, conducted by the European Association of Endoscopic Surgery, um, uh, it looked like only 40% of uh, laparoscopic surgeons reported of a routine use of laparoscopic ultrasound but over 80% mentioned that they expect uh, an increase in the use of it uh, in the future. Um, now, some of the more advances in uh, laparoscopic uh, ultrasound uh, are listed here. Uh, we can uh, have today a 3D image, uh, which is actually a computer-generated image that is based on several series of uh, two uh, dimensional images, or we can use a tip that has actually true two transducers. It's a double transducer tip. And this way, we get a real-time picture from two different angles. And then the computer is processing the information and can provide us one 3D image. And this way, we can have a more accurate uh, view of, uh, of the anatomy. Um, there are available uh, today smaller diameter probes, 5 millimeter ones. Um, there is also a modality of elastography, uh, uh, which is a special mode of the ultrasound that can show us uh, the quality of the tissue and help uh, in differentiating inflammatory tissue or neoplastic tissue. There are also robotic probes, which are actually the same uh, probes that we use in uh, regular laparoscopy, only with a special attachment to the uh, robotic arm. Also under development now are, uh, um, are uh, images that are generated from both a three-dimensional CT image with the real-time ultrasound image, and uh, that can provide us an even more accurate image during surgery. Now, as we mentioned, we can do either an enucleation or a formal resection. Enucleation is done uh, if the tumors are small. Uh, most commonly is the insulinoma. Um, we have to make sure that the tumor is not invading the pancreatic duct or the major vessels. Uh, this is the condition to do an enucleation. And in general, uh, even if they are small, if they are located in the head or the neck of the pancreas, these are much more difficult and challenging procedures because of the anatomy and the proximity to the duodenal wall, CBD, 
vessels, etc. Um, as opposed to uh, the same tumors located in the body or the tail where the uh, enucleation is much easier. Now, uh, it's important to uh, realize that the incidence of pancreatic leak after inoculation is much higher compared to formal resection. I think we can spend an entire session discussing uh, the issue of pancreatic leak and how to avoid it. Unfortunately, uh, different uh, tricks like uh, using a bioglue, somatostatin administration, uh, and even stenting of the pancreatic duct prior to the procedure did not prove to be uh, um, beneficial. Uh, we tried them all, um, and unfortunately, I don't think we have the right answer yet. However, it's also important to realize that uh, when you say pancreatic leak, it sounds terrible, but it's actually not so terrible because it's really a controlled pancreatic fistula, uh, which means that the patient stays with a closed suction drain for uh, a couple of weeks, uh, and then when the secretion, when the amount of secretion uh, reduces, then uh, we can uh, take it out. Now we are moving to a head uh, PNET, and you see here, um, this is the laparoscopic probe scanning the head of the pancreas. There is a space here that we created by dissecting the pancreatic neck of the SMV. Uh, this is the duodenum, of course, and uh, you see here the, the ultrasound image showing a small PNET located about one millimeter under the surface, and you see here in the color Doppler um, that is the, it is a very vascular lesion. This is the enucleation itself. Um, you see here the tumor. It's a, always a well-encapsulated, firm tissue uh, with some normal pancreatic tissue around it. Uh, this is a very typical appearance of an insulinoma, and this is the defect left uh, in the tumor bed. And this is a short clip demonstrating this case. You see here the dissection between the pancreatic neck and the SMV, uh, confluence of the SMV, splenic, and portal vein. And after we uh, divide some of the branches uh, from the SMV to the pancreatic head, uh, we can create a space uh, big enough to uh, introduce the uh, ultrasound probe, as shown here. And now we are scanning the head of the pancreas. And of course, it will be important not only to see the lesion, we always measure it, by the way, to make sure that this is the same lesion seen on the EUS study. Uh, and we also want to see the relation of the lesion uh, to the uh, CBD and the pancreatic duct before we would start uh, the enucleation itself. And you see here also that it's a vascular lesion, very typical to insulinomas. And I don't know if you can see the details uh, but we also uh, identify the CBD about one or two millimeters away from the lesion. And this is the process of the enucleation itself. We cut actually in normal pancreatic tissue. Um, as I mentioned, these tumors are very firm, and it's not very hard to distinguish between normal pancreatic tissue and the tumor itself. But we stop from time to time and use the ultrasound uh, to make sure that uh, we are far enough from the lesion itself. Different energy sources can be used. Uh, you see here that we use the harmonic, but I'm, I, I know that other sources can be used as well. Um, the tumor is uh, completely enucleated. This is the defect left. Um, there is not much bleeding here, but we would always use a hemostatic agent. Uh, this is the specimen. We will now uh, cut it open just to uh, be sure uh, that uh, it looks like an insulinoma. And another uh, uh, nice thing about it, that once you remove the insulinoma, the patient immediately, the level, the glucose levels of the patient immediately increase, and you ask the anesthetist to measure the glucose level, and if they start to increase, you, uh, it's rewarding, and you know that you remove the insulinoma, and the patient will do well. This is some hemostatic agent that we uh, feel the defect and uh, always a closed suction drain. As uh, mentioned before, there is still an incidence, about 25-30% of a controlled pancreatic fistula after uh, these cases. Now, for formal resections, uh, um, the uh, rese formal resections are uh, performed for larger uh, peanuts, 
or if they uh, were growing uh, under observation. If the biopsy uh, shows a high Ki67 index, if the index is above 2%, we would uh, uh, recommend an operation. If we see some suspected lymph nodes on the EUS or on the PET uh, gallium scan, uh, if the uh, splenic vessels are involved, if the pancreatic duct uh, is involved, even though I should say that this is extremely rare in peanuts, um, if the patient has several uh, lesions, like in MEN1 or von Hippel-Lindau, um, and then, uh, once we perform a formal resection, the uh, intraoperative ultrasound is used to determine the site of the division of the pancreas to make sure that we are in clear margins. Now, uh, this is another short clip showing the use of the intraoperative ultrasound in a spleen-preserving distal pancreatectomy. This was the lesion. Um, we always mark on the patient uh, um, if we need to convert and do the... Uh, an open operation, and this is exposing the entire pancreas, uh, the ultrasound uh, tip. Uh, now we would scan from bottom up, um, and you see now very soon the tumor here. We will now uh, make the ultrasound image a little uh, bigger soon, and uh, you would be able to see more details, but you see already now the relations of the tumor to the splenic vessels. Um, this. Uh, was a case that we planned to do spleen-preserving procedures, so it would uh, be really important to make sure that uh, we have a plane between the vessels uh, and the tumor and the pancreas. And you see here again that it's a vascular lesion. Uh, the relation to the pancreatic duct is not that important. Now you see here the feature of uh, 3D ultrasound. Uh, it's not perfect yet, but uh, as you see here, it can provide you also a good image of the lesion itself and its relation to the splenic vessels. Um, now that we uh, determine the exact site of the lesion that is, of course, not seen uh, on just observation, uh, this is the lesion here, and now we will mark the uh, area where we want to do the division of the pancreas. But also, we have to make sure that there are no additional lesions. And this is scanning of the pancreatic neck and head. The, uh, this is the duodenum here in the background. And we see that uh, there are no other lesions in the, uh, in the head of the pancreas. So we can go ahead and do a distal uh, pancreatectomy. Uh, we always encircle the pancreas with a vessel loop to help us retraction for retraction. Now we expose the splenic vessels, both from the bottom and also from the uh, superior surface of the pancreas. Um, once uh, we uh, dissected free the body of the pancreas from the vessels, we will encircle the vessels also with the vessel loop to provide us with the ability of counter-traction. And this way we can uh, divide all the small, fine vessels that course between the splenic vessels and the, pancre and the pancreatic body. And now we continue the dissection towards the pancreatic tail um, you see here the uh, splenic vessels. And once the pancreas is completely mobilized, we are ready uh, for the division. Another shot of the ultrasound showing the tumor. And if we are going to divide here, we should be in safe uh, distance. Um, for the division, we, uh, if it's a normal pancreas, as shown here, we use a vascular cartridge of a linear uh, stapler. If it's a chronic pancreatitis in a very thick, firm pancreas, we need to use sometimes a larger uh, size of uh, cartridge. You see here the division of the pancreas. And soon uh, the entire pancreas will be ready to uh, be uh, extracted. We see here again the splenic vessels. You see the spleen here in the background. Um, another uh, look at the uh, specimen, at the, the specimen uh, that is to be removed. Again, the tumor is uh, here. Um, we would now uh, put uh, the pancreas into a specimen bag, um, remove it, and um, you would now see a clear view of the pancreatic body and tail. Now we can palpate the tumor, and when we open it, uh, you can see the tumor. Actually, this is not a typical appearance of a peanut, uh, but uh, this was the case. Um, now, 
a uh, special uh, subgroup of patients are the one who have a peanut in the neck of the pancreas right above the confluence of the portal vein, SMV, and splenic vein. These uh, patients need a much more extensive procedure like subtotal or near total distal pancreatectomy. Uh, if we do such a procedure, uh, this is the dissection uh, uh, we need to get. Uh, you see here uh, that the pancreatic neck was already divided. This is the pancreatic head stump with a staple line. This is the body of the pancreas. The, uh, we didn't remove it yet. You see here a very clear view of the vascular anatomy. This is the hepatic artery and gastroduodenal artery. Um, this is the specimen uh, with the spleen. Uh, this is the stump of the splenic vein, portal vein, stump of the head of the pancreas, and this is the lesion. Uh, but I hope now we can show you um, a short video clip of this case. This was a 54-year-old uh, patient uh, that was referred for surgery because the peanut was growing from 14 to 28 millimeter in size. You see here the PET gallium scan uh, with an uptake in the pancreatic body. Uh, this was uh, uh, this uh, peanut, and now you see uh, the EUS image of the same peanut. You see here the portal vein, SMV, splenic vein, and you see here uh, the lesion itself. Um, this is, uh, of course, done uh, on the pre-op uh, workup of the patient. Uh, now we always enter the lesser sac, expose the entire pancreas. This is the intraoperative ultrasound. And soon you can see the lesion, um, similar to the lesion that we saw on the EUS. Um, and uh, now we can measure it and make sure that uh, uh, this is uh, the same size as uh, was expected on the EUS. Uh, and it's really always striking to see the similarity between the EUS image and the image that we can get uh, intraoperatively. Now we see the relation to the uh, splenic uh, artery and splenic vein using the color Doppler. Um, here we are going to do a, a formal resection, uh, so uh, it's the, we know that we are going to divide the vessels too. And of course, in this case, uh, there was a glimpse here of the pancreatic duct, but this is also not that important uh, if we are doing a, if we are doing a, por a formal uh, resection. Now uh, we are uh, starting to, uh, we will still scan also the head of the pancreas to make sure there are no synchronous lesion. And this is the division of the inferior mesenteric vein uh, going into the splenic vein as shown here. Uh, the pancreas body is lifted off the retroperitoneum. Uh, we will now divide this, uh, some of the attachments to the retroperitoneum and also the splenic ligaments, because we are performing here a, uh, also a splenectomy. This is the division of the splenic artery close to its origin. We always go uh, for the artery first, uh, and then uh, we will uh, divide the uh, splenic vein. You see here the splenic vein, a pretty wide uh, vein, very close to the portal vein and SMV. Uh, we use the same vascular uh, stapling device. Um, we would add some clips if needed. And now, after the entire pancreas and the vessels are, uh, are free, uh, we are ready to divide the neck of the pancreas. Again, we scan it to make sure that the division is performed in a safe distance from the lesion itself. As I said, this was a growing lesion uh, suspected to be malignant, so we need to be careful and do a, uh, an oncologic uh, resection. Um, this is the division of the pancreatic neck. Uh, this was a normal pancre pancreas, so we used the vascular cartridge. And this is the stump. Uh, we would run here a non-absorbable proline uh, 3 um, suture along the stapling line. Um, and this is the stump of the splenic vein, portal vein, as you saw, the specimen in the bag. Um, we would take it out through this incision. And uh, now this is the surgical specimen, including the entire body and tail of the pancreas spleen. And this is the peanut, typical appearance of it. As you see, it's about almost three centimeter in size. Um, and this is the 
conclusion of the procedure, and this turned out to be actually a benign, well-differentiated uh, neuroendocrine tumor, and 12 uh, peripancreatic uh, lymph nodes uh, were negative. So I think at this point we can stop again, and maybe Dr. Park uh, will take over leading some discussion about what we just saw. Uh, wonderful, uh, beautiful uh, videos and, and presentation, Dr. Reisman. As we kind of draw things to a close, I do want to go to our, uh, our colleagues at Cleveland Clinic, Maine, just for uh, one final uh, question and comment. Um, but I, I want to point out that uh, all of this was done. Your videos all show beautiful laparoscopic technique. Um, and, uh, and so uh, highly skilled uh, laparoscopic uh, hepatopancreatic surgery is uh, still alive and thriving. Um, I also, before I go to Phil and his colleagues here, um, we have a question, and I'll throw this out to you, Dr. Reisman, and the whole uh, audience. The question is, how do you obtain uh, IOUS training? Uh, we heard from Dr. Navinet, it's a part of the resident fellow training at, at Sinai, but if uh, somebody in the audience wants to learn how to start doing this, uh, maybe we can share experiences of how you get this, this training. My question now uh, to the Cleveland Clinic Maine friends is, what percent of cases uh, are you doing of these that are enucleations versus resections? And how, how important is it to you, do you guys believe, to preserve that, that spleen? Hi, Adrian. Um, glad to be here. Unfortunately, um uh, Dr. Uh, Aaron Berber and Alan Cipressi are not here today, but we do have uh, Noonan Ali, who is one of our HPB uh, experts, and uh, Noonan uh, would like to comment. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raisman, for an excellent talk. Um, this, the question is for the intraoperative ultrasound for, um, I think, any pancreatic tumor, uh, especially for laparoscopic case, I think it's very important. Um, one, just to delineate resection margins, then also to identify. So on all our laparoscopic pancreatic cases, we are using ultrasound to identify um, the extent of the tumor in relation to the vessels. Um, the question of enucleation, um, I know Dr. Rice, you mentioned one to two millimeters as being kind of the cutoff. Um, typically, you know, if it's one to two millimeters, the concern would be a much higher concern for leak. Um, and just to see your experience um, with tumors that you had shown that close to the duct, um, and leak rates after that. If um, one to two millimeters, personally, um, I think with a much higher leak rate, I would move towards resection versus just a nucleation. And let, let me ask you, um, how often do you always work as your default uh, a technique to preserve the spleen? Um, and if so, uh, uh, do you always try to preserve the splenic vein or do you, do you count on short gastrics uh, to do so? Uh, we default if it's uh, if there's no concern for malignancy, um, then we will default to splenic preservation, um, and we will attempt to save the splenic vein. Um, a lot of these cases, if we're doing a planned um, preservation of the spleen, we may attempt this robotically as well, just to get uh, better mobilization and uh, dissection around these small uh, vessels to the splenic artery and vein. Um, but we do go in um, if it, there's no concern for malignancy for splenic preservation. Great. Hey, Adrian. Okay, well, let me, let me return yeah, to, I, I, oh, Phil, did you have a Yeah, it's a comment. Yeah, I just, again, I wanted to graduate Dr. Reisman uh, for really just elegant display of this masterful technique. It was really beautiful. Um, but speaking of robotics, I was just curious, um, you know, is there a role, or do they use a robot in some of these uh, cases? Does it help to section? Does it give them better visibility. Um, Dr. We, uh, do, yes, uh, thank you for uh, the question, Dr. Schauer. Uh, we uh, in our uh, hospital do not use uh, the robot. Um, I personally uh, trained on it, uh, and I didn't feel, um, at least at that point, that the robot uh, really uh, gives me a better uh, view or a more precise dissection that uh, I can perform in a regular laparoscopic surgery. I think there are some developments now with other uh, instruments that would uh, may uh, give us a better performance, uh, um, and then we will uh, look into it again. But right now, uh, currently, we do not use the robotic surgery here. Well, I will uh, I'll reiterate that I'm delighted to see advanced uh, laparoscopic skills being uh, maintained and, and trained to the next generation. 
Um, so Dr. Reisman, uh, kind of a, an obvious question, but as a concluding one, it used to be conventional wisdom that uh, uh, if you just can't localize, particularly in insulinoma, that there's a role for uh, blind distal pancreatectomy. Do you believe that what you've shown today in terms of the advances and the utility and the user friendliness of IOUS has really pushed to the side any role for blind uh, distal pancreatectomy? Yeah, I agree 100%. I don't think there is any role uh, today for a uh, blind distal pancreatectomy, hoping that the occult tumor will be in the portion that you removed. I think, uh, as uh, was uh, earlier uh, mentioned by Mount Sinai also, you should do all the investigations, and you would not do any, rese any blind rese uh, resection. You have to uh, make a, a complete diagnosis before attempting any resection. But I also should mention that with all the modalities that uh, were shown here, the PET gallium scan, uh, the EUS, I would think it would be really very, very rare that you would not get a clear uh, preoperative diagnosis in peanuts today. Well, I, uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Reisman, for just a very uh, um, informative and elegant uh, uh, presentation. I thank you, uh, our various uh, uh, participants who uh, uh, contributed comments as well.